breaking down the barriers in South Florida. Is it America great? From the highest ranks in government to a grassroots movement. I can't breathe. We recognize local leaders who are aiming to bridge the racial divide. We're all in this together. And the local push to preserve our rich past. See the dreams fulfilled as we strive to frame the future of South Florida. Welcome to NBC6's Breaking Barriers. I'm Trina Robinson. And I'm Juwan Strader. To build better communities and unite with one another, we must understand our past. By looking back, we can truly tackle the present issues that block us from moving forward as one. Tonight, we first look at the recent rising racial tensions that threaten to stall progress in America. Many in the black community question the legal and justice system after African-American men lost their lives in several police incidents. But what we have learned from these tragedies Tragedies, and how can we prevent them from happening again? Protests erupted in Ferguson, Missouri after the death of 18-year-old Michael Brown, shot and killed by a white police officer. Those protests turned violent after a grand jury decided not to bring charges against Aaron Wilson, the officer involved in the shooting. Then came the video of Eric Garner in Staten Island. Garner died after being put in a police chokehold. Once again, a grand jury cleared the officer involved. That led to even more outrage. And anger spread across the country and all the way to South Florida. The call for change in police departments across the country grew louder. Then, another senseless killing. This one involved two New York police officers gunned down in cold blood as they sat in their patrol car in Brooklyn. A mentally disturbed man confessed to the deadly ambush, claiming it was in retaliation for the deaths of Brown and Garner. He later took his own life. That violence sparked a different type of outrage and protest, this time from those who protect and serve. No justice! Two sides, one, a community that says law enforcement is against them. I don't think that they've done enough. They've done a lot, but there's still more work to be done, and we're here to let the sheriff and all the other local people know that we're in it with them to figure out how we can fix this problem. On the other side, those who say the black community needs to meet them in the middle. In law enforcement, we need to get better at what we do. African-American community needs to come and start meeting us at the table. Since the protest, forms between the South Florida community and law enforcement have opened the dialogue. One example, this form at the University of Miami put on by the ACLU and Wilkie D. Ferguson Jr. Bar Association looking at Miami police policy and concerns. We don't have many complaints. Briar Sheriff Scott Israel recently met with the Dream Defenders, a group concerned about police community relations. It's a training, it's a higher it's how we train, it's how we hire. Um, we treat people with dignity and respect. Dwayne Flournoy was named Hollandale Beach's first black police chief back in 2011. He sat down with me to talk openly about some of the issues, including changes that's needed within police departments across the country. I truly believe that diversity in law enforcement is needed. It's, it's only going to make it better. And Chief Flournoy believes the tragedy sparked a positive discussion to address issues between law enforcement and the community. So you believe that something, instead of backlash, you believe something good may have actually come out of Ferguson in order to better your police department? Of course, because it also gave us an opportunity to communicate to um, the public as it relates to some issues that were brought up, like the militarized equipment and, and why do police officers get out of this, this uniform and get in a more tactical car, uh, cargo type uniform when they're out um, dressing uh, civil unrest. And the loss of another life on either side of this issue is something both sides don't want. We're all in this together. And once we begin to sit around the table and we begin to talk about these issues and truly talk about these issues, that's when change is going to occur. Well, one group that has been very vocal in protest against alleged police brutality is the Dream Defenders. As NBC6's Willard Shepard reports, the movement is led by a young man fighting to tear down the walls of racial and social injustice. 
What we've seen is that um, a lot of the things fought for in generations before um, either need to be fought for again or we need to fight for different things. Philip Agnew is a man who has a vision, a vision much like Dr. Martin Luther King in his famous Washington, D.C. speech. My poor little children. Dr. King cast a hope of the things he would like to see. Dr. King's reality, though, saw efforts to stop minorities from getting an education, going where they wish to eat, and violence at the hands of law enforcement. All deserve a chance to pursue their full measure of happiness. 50 years later, Agnew sees progress. President Obama in the White House, but also much of what Dr. King fought for unchanged. Things have not gotten better. Things have actually gotten worse, but under the guise of a post-racial society or that things are getting better or that people are being treated better. Or we have a black president, we have black police chiefs, black mayors, black councilmen and women that things are now far better. And so you need a movement like this to not only raise awareness and raise consciousness, but to get us truly to where we need to be. Agnew is the executive director of the Dream Defense Defenders, a movement founded in the aftermath of the death of Trayvon Martin. The group spent three days marching and covered 40 miles on the way to the Sanford police station. They shut the station down and 48 hours later, George Zimmerman was arrested. Zimmerman was found not guilty of all charges related to Martin's death and the police chief announced he would resign. Without a movement like this, we're going to continue to raise a generation of children who have no hope, possibility, dreams, imagination about a different world or that a different world is possible. Agnew's involvement with the Trayvon Martin case wasn't the first time he became involved in a fight for justice. As a college student in Tallahassee, he organized a sit-in at the governor's mansion after a teenager who was at a correctional youth boot camp died. The Dream Defenders have taken a strong position against Stand Your Ground laws, and Agnew believes what is depicted in the recent movie Selma still exists, but in a different way. We need some radical, radical, radical different um, ways of engaging in community with one another and different ways of engaging with the state because I think we've seen, we just saw Selma yesterday, that incremental reforms um, will do um, only so much. Willard Shepard, NBC6, South Florida. And Mr. Agnew had so much more to say. We have an extended version of his interview on the NBC6 app and NBC6.com. Just log on and search Dream Defender. Tonight we're honoring South Florida's legends and we begin with Miami Beach Deputy Chief Loretta Hill. Deputy Chief Hill is the second in command and is the highest ranking African American in the history of that department. She was sworn in back in January. Hill is a 20 year veteran of the Arlington, Texas Police Department. She says her job is to ensure officers are connected with the community and serve all populations. Coming up, we go inside the first school built for blacks in Broward County. A step back in time reveals the deep-rooted lessons that forever changed a community. And Overtown's Concrete Rose, how a demure painter bloomed from the grime and crime to become one of the nation's most celebrated artists. A symphonic journey here in South Florida. Next, one group is paving the path for local students passionate about music and their cultural heritage. Segregation in the early days of Broward County left most blacks without an education. But one Fort Lauderdale school opened the doors for African Americans to learn and eventually thrive. Photos displayed in the old Dillard Museum tell a story truly in black and white. Blacks once lived poor, uneducated, and a racist, often hostile Broward County. In the early 1900s, lynchings and even Ku Klux Klan rallies at some Fort Lauderdale theaters was the norm. But in 1924, this school became a catalyst for advancement as Broward's first so-called colored school. This is the first public school that was built for blacks in Broward County. The old Dillard School was later transformed into the Dillard Museum that's on the National Registry of Historic Places. 
So this room was the first exhibit that was put together by our curator, Ernestine Ray. She took the exhibit that kind of shows you what life was like between 1924 and 1950. Students attended school only a few months. Education for blacks stopped at the sixth grade. Others dropped out by the third to pick crops to support their impoverished families. The law said that any black child that was over nine years old could work. So at nine years old, they would start working in the fields. Through protests, petitions, and fights with farmers to get the children out of the fields and into the classroom, eventually a full school year became a reality. Even though they were farm workers, they felt that by establishing a school, the next generation would be better. And Dillard would again make Make history by becoming the first black school in Broward County to go up to the 12th grade, graduating its first senior class in 1938. So you had black children from all over Broward County, they came here for the 12th grade. But the learning experience, right down to the materials used, was nothing like what white kids were entitled to. This is a desk that's actually from Dillard's, and they still wanted to show that comparison of what, how, the, how there was a disparity and the things that they were receiving for the education. Still, Dillard's black educators exposed students to music, the arts, and skilled trains. And Dillard's jazz room enshrines one of its instructors whose music landed Dillard on the world stage. Probably the most famous person that ever went to this school was Cannonball. Um, he was considered to be the most commercially successful jazz musician of his day. Another room depicts the harshness of early black life, as folks eked out a meager existence doing back-breaking work with archaic tools. Despite the struggles, the little school became the center of black life, helping blacks to thrive. The old Dillard Museum provides us a powerful and poignant picture because it was a pivotal player in shaping it. And that your mind can take these things of history and it can make a better future by having that background on where it comes from. So I think they come through change and change in saying that we can make a better society. Amazing story, Trina. I had no clue that this even existed here in South Florida. It's truly a hidden jewel. Mm -hmm. Hopefully it more is. people will get out and see it. Yes, I know I need to. All right, well, back in the day, another center of black life in South Florida was the Hampton House. African-American celebrities and socialites would stay at the motel when visiting Miami. NBC6 reporter Steve Litz shows us how the city is reviving the historic building. History will happen here again. Miami's Hampton House being brought back to life, at one point the gathering place for African Americans during the days of segregation, and famous ones too. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in the pool, Malcolm X snapping a picture of Muhammad Ali. Jackie Robinson was once at the motel on Northwest 27th Avenue and 42nd Street. I'm in awe, I'm really in awe. Miami historian Dr. Enid Pinckney is leading the restoration effort. To come in here right now and look at this place, to see the transformation, I, it's a spiritual thing with me. Dr. Pinckney would come as a young adult. Everybody wanted me to come in and recite poems. Audrey Edmondson remembers being here as a little girl. The Miami-Dade Commissioner has been instrumental in the government's role in restoring the historic building, which had its heyday in the jazz era of the 50s and 60s, then shuttered since the early 1970s. From that era to when it went down to when we're raising it back up, I'm just proud to be a part of it. If you've driven down 27th Avenue, you may remember seeing this building in such disrepair. In fact, steel support beams had to be brought in and they propped up these walls to make sure they didn't fall down. Once fully restored, the Hampton House will include a museum, workspaces, a performance room, and also a restaurant. A building that will have special meaning for people like Enid Pinckney. Respect for our history and for our heritage and for our culture. In Brownsville, I'm Steve Litz, NBC6 South Florida. And speaking of history, last week we lost a South Florida legend who dedicated her life to changing the lives of others. Georgia Ayers died in her sleep last Tuesday at the age of 86. The longtime activist was the founder of Alternative Programs, a nonprofit that helped first-time criminals find jobs and stay out of jail. 
Ayers leaves behind 20 great grandchildren and a legacy of service in the community. What a woman. And join the conversation on social media. Tweet us or leave a comment on our Facebook page describing how you or someone you know is breaking barriers in your community. Be sure the hashtag breaking barriers is included. What a monumental moment for Miami-Dade Commission Chairman John Monestein. Last month, he became the first Haitian American to ever hold the title. The chairman is using his success story as motivation to help those living in poverty. Mr. Monestein's personal journey started on a rickety boat ride to the United States to now the top position at County Hall. An incredible story, Jawan. Well, self-taught artist Purvis Young was a man of few words, but his stories resonated across the nation and beyond. Those stories are depicted in thousands of colorful art installations that reveal what life was like for blacks in the inner city. In a neighborhood plagued by violence, drugs, and poverty, emerged a creative genius who roused the outside world in the 70s. Miami's Overtown was the stage for Purvis Young, as he captivated many with his vibrant, symbolic paintings. Uh, some just told me one day to paint my feeling. I started letting the public see my art. Purvis created an art gallery in the heart of the ghetto. The thought-provoking pieces became magnetic forces, pulling in art collectors, entertainers, and tourists. A man of simplicity, Purvis used other people's trash as his canvases. He was always interested uh, in, in preserving what was already there and just creating, you know, something out of essentially nothing. Abandoned furniture, plywood, metal scraps, all transformed into treasures. And out of the ashes came his works. Much like his creations, Purvis hit rock bottom before rising. As a teen, he spent three years in prison for breaking and entering. It was there he realized his purpose. When I was in my cell, one night I woke up and the angels came to me and I told them, you know, hey man, it's not my life. And they said they were gonna make a way for me. After his release, Purvis immersed himself in his craft. He just worked and worked and he never stopped working. He was always creating. By the early 80s, Purvis was a national icon. His paintings reflect black life in the inner city. With every brushstroke, he sent a message to the world. He uses a lot of the imagery in his paintings to actually make a statement about the you know, politics. He would put halos uh, behind the heads of the faces, the, the faceless faces in a sense. And this was the, because Purvis saw the good in everyone that he came in contact with. 45 years later, Purvis's artwork hangs in museums across the U.S., including the Smithsonian. In South Florida, some of his masterpieces can be found at the Bass Museum of Art. And there are two current exhibitions, one at MOCA in North Miami, the other at the Lear Theater Cultural Arts Complex in Overtown. We're displaying about 250 pieces of Purvis Young works, and maybe a little bit more than that because we're using some of his paperwork, which is very uh, rare. Purvis, a rare jewel, molded by the struggle and pain of his community. Truly an artistic genius. Well, Purvis Young died in 2010 from complications from a kidney transplant. He was only 67. In 2008, Miami officials honored him with the key to the city and recognized Purvis as a green artist. And the artwork of another icon is also on display here in South Florida. Personal sketches created by the late Nelson Mandela are featured in an exhibit at the Miramar Cultural Center. The exhibit runs through tomorrow. Well, one South Florida group is breaking barriers through music. It uses rhythms from the motherland to empower young minds. NBC 6's Sharon Lawson has a story. Through the 
beat of the drums and the melodic voices blended in perfect harmony, these students' minds awaken to explore their roots through music, spearheaded by Willie Stewart, formerly of the international reggae group Third World. To me, Africa was the beginning of civilization, and so the drums started there. Stewart's unique program, Rhythms of Africa, originated through his nonprofit, Embrace Music Foundation, where Stewart goes into schools for three months, taking them on a journey through their ancestry. In other words, we played soca, we did reggae, we did Cuban, Wawanko, all the different rhythms was influenced by Africa. Somerset Academy Charter School in Miramar has embraced the program, and educators are already noticing positive changes. A lot of the students that were reserved or quiet have become more outspoken, um, GPAs have have increased, academics have increased. This really has has made me open up to like what I love. I love to dance, I love to sing, I love to drum, I just love instruments, period. Stewart also shares with them the diverse and rich history of African musical instruments and the wide range of drums. Centuries ago, the drums weren't only used for entertaining, but for communicating. Stewart even showed me a basic rhythm used during ceremonies. Within the beat, one would receive the text of the message, call it a melodic Morse code. Stewart is hoping to bring Rhythms of Africa to all South Florida schools, not only educating them on our history, but empowering them to embrace music. We're transforming communities through music. In Miramar, Sharon Lawson, NBC6, South Florida. What a great outlet. Well, another South Florida legend tonight is Guinness World Record pilot Barrington Irving. The Miami native is the youngest person ever to fly solo around the world. Captain Irving took the historic flight while he was still a student at Florida Memorial University. Last fall, the aviator launched the Flying Classroom, which landed in 11 different countries. Irving says he wants to inspire students to become scientists, engineers, and pilots. NBC6, we celebrate black history with an annual celebration. The staff came together to reflect on the past and talk about the future. The keynote speaker at our event, former president of the Fort Lauderdale branch of the NAACP, William McCormick. McCormick is also a successful healthcare executive and entrepreneur. He runs Medavance Billing. He emphasized the power of one, uniting with one another to make our own history draw. Oh, he was a great speaker, oh, Trina. He was. And we also had some fun as well with the live performance by the Pan Paradise Steel Drum Band and the NBC6 Telemundo family enjoyed the savory Southern cuisine. And you too can celebrate those featured in tonight's program or others, pioneers out there across South Florida. May their stories of perseverance inspire you to break down the barriers you face every day. Thank you so much for watching us. Be sure to make it a great night.